From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! It was a real shock when all of a sudden his hands were all over me. But it's when he started putting his hand up my skirt. And that was it. That was it. The 16 women who've accused President Trump of sexual misconduct are back. Now, several of them are demanding Congress investigate, as are at least 56 Congress members. We'll speak with Jessica Lees about what happened to her when she sat next to Donald Trump in first class on a plane. And we'll speak with Samantha Holvey, a former Miss USA contestant, when Trump owned the pageant, then the movement to impeach. I think people are ready to stand up, uh, and, and they need to, because this is an urgent matter. This is not something, again, that we can wait on for uh, something we look at in 2019 or 2020. We need to lay the groundwork now for the call for impeachment proceedings against this president. We'll speak with constitutional attorney John Boniface, and we continue our interview with Dr. Bandy Lee, the Yale psychiatrist who edited the book the Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. We're pushing for an evaluation. Uh, we're warning about dangerousness. We're actually trying our best to educate the public so that people will be aware. They will be affirmed in uh, what they are seeing. They will be educated on uh, the depths of what they are seeing and also uh, that there is a way of dealing with this situation. We look at the duty to warn movement. All that and more coming up. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's Democracy Now! special by looking at the growing movement calling on President Trump to resign over multiple claims of sexual misconduct, harassment and assault against him. The renewed calls come amidst the international Me Too movement, in which women across the globe have come forward to accuse a slew of powerful men of sexual harassment, assault and rape. In December, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand became the fifth senator and first female senator to call for President Trump to step down over 16 claims he harassed, assaulted or engaged in misconduct with women. In response, Trump attacked Gillibrand, tweeting, quote, lightweight Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, a total flunky for Chuck Schumer and someone who had come to my office begging for campaign contributions not so long ago and would do anything for them, is now in the ring fighting against Trump, he tweeted. Senator Gillibrand fired back, saying President Trump's attack was sexist. It was a sexist smear attempting to silence my voice. And I will not be silenced on this issue, neither will the women who stood up to the president yesterday, and neither will the millions of women who have been marching since the Women's March to stand up against policies they do not agree with. The USA Today editorial board jumped in with an unusually forceful editorial headlined, Will Trump's Lows Ever Hit Rock Bottom? The editorial went on, A president who would all but call Senator Kirsten Gillibrand a whore is not fit to clean the toilets in the Barack Obama Presidential Library or to shine the shoes of George W. Bush, unquote. Meanwhile, three of the 16 women who've publicly accused Trump of sexual misconduct held a news conference last month in New York demanding Congress take action. The women shared accounts in which they said Trump groped, fondled, forcibly kissed them or engaged in some kind of misconduct. The press conference was held by Brave New Films, which released the documentary 16 Women and Donald Trump in November. He groped me. He absolutely groped me. And he just slipped his hand there, touching my private part. He turned to me and um, embraced me and gave me a kiss on the lips. And I, I remember being shocked and because I would have just thought to shake somebody's hand, but that was his first response with. It was a real shock when all of a sudden his hands were all over me. But it's when he started putting his hand up my skirt. And that was it. That was it. The person on my right, who unbeknownst to me at that time was Donald Trump, put their hand up my skirt. He did touch my vagina through my underwear. 
as the women walked across the table, um, Donald Trump would look up under their skirt and, you know, comment on whether they had underwear or didn't have underwear. I didn't want to have to walk across the table. I wanted to get out of there. Then his hand touched the right inside of my breast. I felt intimidated and I felt powerless. Lana was standing right next to him when he touched my butt. When we entered the room, he grabbed each of us tightly in a hug and kissed each one of us without asking permission. After that, I received another call from either Donald or a male calling on his behalf, offering me $10,000. His actions are a huge testament to his character, that of uncontrollable misogyny, entitlement, and being a sexual assault apologist. I'm, you know, sitting there in my robe and having, you know, my makeup and hair done and everything, and he comes walking in, and I was just like, oh my goodness, so like, what is he doing saw, back here? Saw, I saw him walk into the dressing room. He just came strolling right in. There was no second to put a robe on or any sort of clothing or anything. Um, some girls were topless, other girls were naked. Waltzing in, when we're naked, or half naked in a very physically vulnerable position. And he came to me and started kissing me open mouthed as he was pulling me towards him. He then grabbed my shoulder and began kissing me again very aggressively and placed his, placed his hand on my breast. And I said, come on man, get real. He repeated my words back to me, get real, as he began thrusting his genitals. That's an excerpt from producer Robert Greenwald's 16 Women and Donald Trump. In December, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I sat down with Samantha Holvey, a former Miss USA contestant for North Carolina, when Trump owned the pageant. I began by asking her about the first time she met Donald Trump. The first time I met Donald Trump, we were in New York City doing a media tour, all 51 of the Miss USA contestants, and we were at Trump Tower, and they lined us all up, and so he could meet all of us. And I'm thinking this is going to be a meet and greet, you know, lots of eye contact. That was not the case at all. He walks by, and ev by every one of us, or at the very least me, he just looked me up and down like I was a piece of meat. There was no, hi, how are you doing? Are you excited to be here? None of that. I was just a piece of meat that was his property. And I thought, oh, goodness, I hope I never have to deal with him again. I don't, I don't want to be around him. And then finals night rolls around, and I'm, you know, in hair and makeup. I've got curlers in my hair, nothing but a robe on. I'm just 20 years old, and he comes waltzing in to hair and makeup and is just looking around, not talking to us, asking us how we're doing. And by the way, you know, Miss USA was not my first pageant. I've been—I've com competed in other pageants, and the directors, no men were ever backstage. So this is not something that happens. So I see him walk into hair and makeup, and he's looking us all over, and then he wa waltz right into the dressing room, where we have two big security guards making sure that nobody but female contestants and chaperones are allowed in there. But he walks right on in. And to hear him talking about he's never met any of us, um, you know, this is what happens every year. It's, it wasn't just 2006. He bragged about this on Howard Stern. And silly me, I should have been watching Howard Stern because he bragged about it the year before I competed at Miss USA. So this was a known thing that he did. And so it's just amazing to call, to call me a liar when I'm just verifying his own words. <laughs> Well, White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders responded to the allegations against Trump during Monday's press briefing. This is what she said. That's the president said himself. He thinks it's a good thing uh, that women are coming forward, but he also feels strongly that a mere allegation shouldn't determine the course. Uh, and in this case, the president has denied any of these allegations, as have eyewitnesses. Uh, and several reports have shown those eyewitnesses also uh, back up the president's claim in this process. And again, the American people knew this and voted for the president, and we feel like we're ready to move forward in that process. So, Samantha, your response to a Sarah Huckabee Sanders' statement, also, you initially raised these allegations that did many of the women last year during the campaign. And uh, what's uh, the change now, the decision now to come to this press conference yesterday? 
Um, you know, it was a tough decision to come back out because I did get a lot of backlash last year when I spoke out, and so I wasn't sure if I wanted to go through all of that again. Um, but when the the idea was that all of us would come together, that all you know, 16 women would come together and seeing us as a group, seeing us there supporting each other as well as telling our stories, there's power in numbers, and that's what I was just hoping, that maybe this year it would be different, since the climate is different. Samantha, you're from North Carolina. Um, I went to college in North Carolina. <coughs> I grew up in West Virginia. Oh. I was born in Texas. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Southern girl. <laughs> so, which makes it even more relevant mm -hmm. to talk about Roy Moore right now. Your thoughts about President Trump endorsing this accused pedophile, this accused child molester? I was absolutely disgusted but not surprised, because um, that's his M.O. That, that's, that is another testament to his character, to the person he is. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that women come out with evidence. And this is, like, to make sure everybody knows, this is not a he said, she said thing. This is a he said, she verified what he said, and then he said that he didn't say that. So, you know, it's not, it's not a surprise that he came out for Roy Moore. Um, but what I would love to see, I would love to see Republicans take a stand, because women's issues, the treatment of women, that's not a partisan issue. That's not something that only Democrats should believe in. This is something that every woman in America and every man in America needs to stand up and say, no, we are no longer accepting this type of behavior. That was Samantha Holvey, a former Miss USA contestant from North Carolina, when Trump owned the pageant. In December, Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke with Trump accuser Jessica Leeds. She recently retired after working 30 years as a stockbroker. She's a mother of two and grandmother of eight. I began by asking Jessica Leeds what happened to her when she encountered Donald Trump in the first-class cabin of a commercial flight in 1979. I was traveling for a paper company as a sales rep. There were very few women at that time working on the road. So it was not unusual for the steward to come back and ask me if I wanted to come up to first class. And I was delighted, because the food was better, the seats were more comfortable. So I, I came up, and uh, the gentleman sitting on the um, window side and right at the bulkhead um, I sat down, and he introduced himself as Donald Trump. At that time, I knew nothing about the Trump Organization, Donald Trump, or anything, because I did not work out of New York City. I was based in Connecticut, but I flew in and out of New York. Well, they served the meal, and after it was cleared, he jumped all over me and started groping me and kissing me and this. And at the time, I remember thinking, why doesn't the guy across the aisle come to my aid? Why doesn't the stewardess come back? You know, but nothing was said. I didn't say anything. I don't remember him saying anything. How did he first? You had been talking at lunch while you were eating? A little bit. Not, uh -huh. not a lot. Not a lot. And he just turned to you? Yeah. Yeah. And did what? And started grasping me and pulling me and groping my breasts and trying to kiss me. But it's when he started to put his hand up my skirt that I managed to wiggle out, because I'm not a small person. And I also managed to remember my purse and went to the back of the airplane, and, and that was the rest of the flight. To where the flight attendants are, you just right. went back to the very right. back. Right, right, right. And uh, when the plane landed, I made sure that everybody was off the plane before I did, because I didn't want to run into him again. I did not complain to the airlines. I did not complain to my boss. That was, that was not done. There were all sorts of silly things that would happen on airplanes, like, guys, you want to join the Mile High Club? I mean, they, you know, these were things that, at that time, we tolerated. So fast forward, I left and, and came to New York City. This was like in, like, 81, 82. I got a job with the Humane Society of New York. And they were having this, this um, fundraising gala at Saks Fifth Avenue. And I'm the new kid on the block, so I'm really, really thrilled to be involved with this. And it was a, a wonderful New York sparkly night, and I got to meet all these designers who are now since gone. 
but Oscar de la Renta and Bill Blass and Jeffrey Beam and Mary McFadden and all of them. And up comes—I'm I'm at the table that gave out the table assignments. Up comes Trump with his wife, Ivana, who's very pregnant. And I look at him, and by this time, having worked for the Humane Society, I was aware of who this guy was. Um, the Trump family and everybody on the society scene was very important to the Humane Society to bring him in. So I'm remembering him. But I hand him this, um, this chip, and he looks at me, and he says, I remember you. You're that—and he used the C word from the airplane. A uh, C word used to refer to a woman. Yes. Yes. And it was like it had been a crowded scene around the table, but it was like all of a sudden everybody just sort of disappeared. And it's not that I felt threatened, but I felt very much alone. And he took his stick and he went and he went on. Well, fast forward to 2015 and 16. When I realized that Trump was actually going to run for president, I started telling everybody who would stand for it, my family, my friends, everybody and anybody, my book club, my neighbors, everybody, I would say, listen, let me tell you what kind of a person Donald Trump is. This was my experience with him. For the most part, they were women, and for the most part, they believed me. There were some that didn't, because it was a long time ago. But coming up to the debates, it was the second debate, and when Anderson Cooper challenged Trump, have you ever groped a woman? He said, no, 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 let's talk about Syria. And Anderson didn't let him off the hook. Have you ever groped a woman? No, no, no. Well, I'm on my feet yelling at the TV, because, you know, yes, you did. And I didn't sleep well that night. And I got up in the morning, and I picked up my newspaper, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write a letter to the editor. And I, my, I opened up my computer, and my email was flying out the wall. It just was incredible. All my friends saying, you got to say something now. You got to say something. So I composed this letter to the editor. I sent it off to the New York Times, went swimming, came back a couple of hours later, and there was a message from the Times, would I please call them? And I did. And this woman reporter, Megan Tui, um, questioned me. I mean, we talked for over an hour, and then she said, can I send a reporter? <sighs> this for a letter to the editor? You know. So, yes, she sent a reporter. He and I talked for about two hours, and he took the names of the people that I had told, like my son, like my nephew, like my friends, like my neighbor. And they called them and said and asked them, did Jessica tell you this story over the past year? And they all uh, confirmed that that's what I had done. So then the Times asked, well, can we do a video? And by this time, I'm going, wow, this is <laughs> getting pretty strange. And they did a video, and that came out Wednesday night. And then Thursday morning, I open my door and pick up my newspaper, and it's below the fold. But there's my picture. And I remember thinking, holy <laughs> Now. For about a couple of months, and then there was a, this um, uh, interview with Anderson Cooper, and I agreed to that because he was the guy who asked the question. And he treated me, I thought, very, very well, and, and we had a good conversation. But then my kids insisted that I leave the city, because there was people hanging around the door. And since I'm too old to know how to do the Internet and the Facebook and all that, um, I have no idea of, of the, the hate mail that, that came in. And we disconnected the phone, and I left town for, for a couple of days. I went out to a small town in Pennsylvania. And the next day, 
we go to the post office, and the women in the post office come up to me, and they say, thank you, and you're so brave. We go to the bank. The tellers at the bank, the customers in the bank, come out and say, thank you, and you're so brave. We go to the farmer's market. We go to the grocery store. The neighbors in Robin's neighborhood all come in when they find out that I'm there, and they all say the same thing. They say, thank you, and you're so brave. I come back to the city. I go to the Y for, for swimming and for exercise, and the women started coming up to me, but they also said, I have a story. So I began to hear all these stories, some of them really horrific, some of them very minor. This guy in my office came in and he took my breath. I was like, holy, he did what? So it went on for a while and then things calmed down. And then the anniversary of, well, and Trump got elected. and. It was extremely disappointing. You're now calling for a congressional investigation? Yes. Yes. Explain. Well, the problem with the um, political scene is the fact that Trump really feels like he doesn't have anybody over him. He doesn't have—there's nobody telling him—nobody's the boss of the White House except Trump. It's up to Congress. To, to haul, to, to bring him to task for, for who he is and what he is. I'm hoping the Mueller investigation will do it, but, but uh, at this point, I have to do, have to continue doing what I feel is important about the sexual aggression issues. So it's up to, I think it's up to Congress to, to step forward. Fifty-six women in Congress. Have. Five senators, um, four of the men, one of them Kristen Gillibrand, who he just um, uh, verbally attacked, mm -hmm. um, have called for his resignation. Yes. Well, that would be something else, too. But he, he will never, I think, it's just like he doesn't remember these things anymore. He, as I said, he remembered me after a couple of years, and I'm, I'm not sure why. But he doesn't remember, because he, he's— done it all his life, if, if some investigative power could go back and check with his high school and college years, I bet the women that he dated then had the same experience. And clearly, this is not just about dating. No. No, this, this is, this is the, the label sexual aggression. It really is. It's, and it's control over something. He, he just— ha I love it when he says he appreciates women, but he doesn't. What he wants is some arm candy. And you've talked about the massive discrepancy between women survivors remembering every single oh. detail of what happened and male what, abusers completely forgetting. What, what, yeah. Women remember in exquisite detail when it happened, how it happened, where it happened, how they got out of it, how they got home. Most of them talked about throwing their clothes away. Most of them said that they felt responsible for what happened, and they didn't want to tell anybody, even their parents or their spouses or everything. They remember it, whether they were 8 years old or whether they were 30 years old. You said you never wore a dress on a plane again. I stopped wearing skirts. I started, oh, pantsuits were the— Because he reached up your yeah, skirt. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to—and I cut my hair from, from being long to, to short. It was one of those things where you, as—and this is what I object to—you, as the victim, take on the responsibilities to somehow or another prevent these situations from happening. Do you want President Trump to resign? Oh, resign, uh, be taken out, uh, absolutely. That was Jessica Leeds. She recently retired after working 30 years as a stockbroker. When we come back, we look at the movement to impeach President Trump. Dicen que yo soy peligrosa, que yo soy dolorosa, porque quiero vivir así. Dicen 
que yo soy enjundiosa, caprichosa y hermosa, que no puedo seguir así. Te digo que sí soy peligrosa, que sí soy dolorosa, porque te quiero para... Grammy Award-winning Mexican singer Lila Downs singing Peligrosa. Dangerous Woman in the Democracy Now! studios. You can watch her full interview and performance at democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. And this Democracy Now! special, we turn now to the growing movement across the United States to impeach President Trump, which many say is only slated to grow stronger in 2018. This fall, a half dozen Democrats introduced articles of impeachment against Trump, accusing him of obstruction of justice and other offenses. Co-sponsors include Democratic representatives Steve Cohen, Luis Gutierrez, Al Green, Marsha Fudge, Adriano Espaillat and John Yarmuth. In December, the House rejected the effort, even as 58 Democrats voted in support of the resolution, nearly a third of the caucus. Meanwhile, at least 17 communities around the country are on record calling for impeachment proceedings against President Trump. Well, last month, I sat down with constitutional attorney John Boniface, co-founder and director of Free Speech for People. To be clear, what we're doing here with this impeachment campaign that we launched with Roots Action on the day of the inauguration, because the president had refused to divest from his business holdings all across uh, the world in defiance of the anti-corruption provisions of the Constitution. What we're doing, Amy, is designed to defend our Constitution and our democracy. This is not about being dissatisfied about certain policies of the president. This is about the Constitution and the basic fundamental principle in this country that no one is above the law, not even the president of the United States. And he walked into the Oval Office that day already defying the rule of law, already refusing to comply with those two anti-corruption provisions of the Constitution. Explain exactly what those two anti-corruption um, um, articles of the Constitution are and what he refused to do with his businesses. So those two anti-corruption provisions are the Foreign Emoluments Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause. The Foreign Emoluments Clause makes clear that the president shall not receive, nor any other federal elected official, shall not receive any payments or financial benefits of any kind from any foreign governments. The Domestic Emoluments Clause applies only to the president and says he shall not receive any financial benefits or payments of any kind from the federal government or the state government other than his federal salary. This is a president who has 111-plus business interests all over the world, many of which involve illegal foreign benefits, foreign government benefits to him personally through his a company, the Trump Organization, as well as having properties all over the United States that involve state government benefits and the federal government through the leasing of the post office square in Washington, D.C., that is now the place where the Trump International Hotel resides. So what we're dealing here with is a president who knew, prior to taking the Oval Office, warned by constitutional scholars that he needed to divest from his business interests in order to comply uh, with those anti-corruption provisions. He refused to, and he is engaged in treating the Oval Office as a profit-making enterprise at the public expense. How have things changed uh, since January, when Donald Trump became president? I think what has happened is we've seen a growing list of impeachable offenses that require an impeachment investigation in the U.S. Congress, parallel to the Mueller investigation. This is not a question of having to wait and see whether or not the federal criminal investigation that's proceeding uh, turns up violations of federal criminal law by the president or any of his associates. That's a separate question. The question here are crimes against the state. That is what impeachment is about, abuse of power, abuse of public trust. And not only through the violations of the anti-corruption provisions, there's now, of course, evidence of obstruction of justice. There's evidence of potential conspiracy with the Russian government to interfere with the 2016 elections and violate federal campaign finance laws, among others. There's now uh, evidence of abuse of the pardon power and the pardoning of former Maricopa County, Arizona Sheriff Joe R. Pyle. There's recklessly threatening nuclear war against a foreign nation. There's misuse of the Justice Department to try to prosecute political adversaries. And there's the giving aid and comfort to neo-Nazis and white supremacists. All of this, all of this deserves an impeachment investigation in the U.S. House of Representatives. 
So, in response to some Democratic leaders warning against calls for impeachment before uh, Robert Mueller's investigation has been completed, billionaire environmentalist Tom Steyer defended his $20 million ad campaign to impeach President Trump and blasted his critics, telling The Wall Street Journal the Republican nominee wasn't really a Republican. The person who energized the Democratic Party wasn't really a Democrat. So, when I hear the Washington establishment tell me, shut the F up, I think, well, maybe. And on Thursday, he tweeted, it doesn't surprise me that the political establishment in Washington, D.C. can't imagine the idea of the American people having an independent voice. They're scared of any threat to their control, but it's important to do what's right, said Tom Steyer. I want to play a clip of the ad that has been running on television. He's brought us to the brink of nuclear war, obstructed justice at the FBI. And in direct violation of the Constitution, he's taken money from foreign governments and threatened to shut down news organizations that report the truth. If that isn't a case for impeaching and removing a dangerous president, then what has our government become? That's the billionaire Tom Steyer, um, who has spent millions on this ad campaign that's running on television. Uh, can you talk about what he is attempting to do? It's a, the need to impeach campaign, and whether you're working with him, John Boniface. Well, we're in communication with Tom Steyer and his team about collaborating, possibly. And we do think what's important here is to elevate the national conversation. He's obviously helping to do that. Uh, we fully agree with all that he's saying about the need for this impeachment process to move forward in the House of Representatives. And the more voices that come forward from the American people all over the country is going to help push that forward in Congress. So let's talk about what's happened this November. These six House Democrats announcing they've introduced articles of impeachment against President Trump. This is Congressman Steve Cohen making the announcement on November 15th. I'm proud to stand here with my friend, Congressman Gutierrez, with other Congress people who will be here uh, in announcing that we are introducing articles of impeachment to remove President Trump from office. There will be, uh, I believe, six signatories on the resolution. Um, we have taken this action because of great concern for the, our country and our Constitution, our national security and our democracy. We believe that President Trump has violated the Constitution, and we've introduced five articles of impeachment. Again, that's Congress member Steve Cohen of Memphis, Tennessee, joining him Luis Gutierrez of Chicago, Marsha Fudge of Ohio, Adriano Espaillat of New York, John Yarmouth of Kentucky, and Al Green of Houston, Texas. So explain what they're introducing. Well, they've introduced five articles of impeachment, and they've done it as a group. And it's significant because, up until now, there were two members of Congress, Al Green being one of them, Congressman Al Green from Houston, and Congressman Brad Sherman from Los Angeles, who had introduced articles of impeachment around obstruction of justice. These articles go beyond obstruction of justice, including that, but also the violations of the foreign and domestic emoluments clauses, uh, and the president's continued attacks on freedom of the press and on the independence of the judiciary. Uh, and what's significant here, Amy, is that these articles have been introduced by members of Congress despite the continued opposition by their own party's leadership in the Congress. Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi has made clear that she doesn't think impeachment should move forward at this time, and yet they are going ahead and moving this forward. And I think they're asking for other members of Congress to join them beyond those who already have stepped forward. And we, as Americans all across the country, should push for an impeachment investigation and should urge our members of Congress to take the same kind of action. So, respond to Nancy Pelosi. I mean, what these Democrats are saying is this is not the way to retake the House in 2018. Um, that if you disagree with the president, the way to deal with that is through elections. Explain why you see key impeachment as key. Well, we're a nonpartisan organization. We're not involved in the political strategy of any political party. What we are focused on is defending our Constitution. And at this particular moment in time, it is not acceptable to say that we will simply kick the can down the road and wait until after an election cycle to lay the groundwork for the impeachment proceedings. They may not happen tomorrow. They may not get started next month. But the fact is, we need to be laying that groundwork and making this call now. And members of Congress, whether they're Democratic, Republican, Independent, or what have you, need to be stepping up to protect 
and defend the Constitution. That's the oath they took, in addition to the president taking that oath, to protect, defend, and preserve the Constitution. And the other point on this, uh, Amy, is that Nancy Pelosi has been saying that we don't have the facts out. We don't have the Mueller investigation completed. But what they're really saying is they want other facts out, because we already have the facts out about what this president has done with respect to the emoluments clauses, with respect to obstruction of justice, and so many other impeachable offenses. And when we look at the Mueller investigation, we're mixing apples and oranges. That's a criminal investigation, whether or not the president and his associates have committed violations of federal criminal law. The question of impeachment is about abuse of power, abuse of public trust, crimes against the state. And it is just wrong for any member of Congress to suggest that a criminal investigation needs to be completed before an impeachment proceeding can begin. One of the people who uh, has gone before the um, uh, congressional committees is Roger Stone, one of President Trump's oldest advisers. Um, he issued what appeared to be a veiled threat warning in August any politician who voted to impeach President Trump would face a violent response. Try to impeach him. Just try it. You will have a spasm of violence in this country, an insurrection like you've never seen. You think? No question. You think if he got impeached, like the, the, the country Both would go Both sides down? are heavily armed, my friend. Yes, absolutely. The, uh, this is not 1974. They, the, the people will not stand for impeachment. A politician who votes for it would be endangering their own life. There will be violence on both sides. I'll make this clear. I'm not advocating violence, but I'm predicting it. That's Roger Stone speaking to TMZ, says there would be a violent response, John Boniface. Well, it's an outrageous statement, but it also highlights that we cannot allow fear to dictate our response to this lawless president. We cannot say that we're going to stay on the sidelines here while the Constitution is being shredded because of that kind of claim uh, that Roger Stone or anyone else might make. So explain how impeachment would work. What would the process look like? So the first process involves the House Judiciary Committee uh, taking up the question. The House of Representatives would need to pass a resolution that would advance uh, to the House Judiciary Committee the question of an impeachment investigation or articles uh, of impeachment. Uh, the you know, Congressman Al Green has said that he wants to go to the floor with a privileged resolution immediately that will force a vote in the House of Representatives as early uh, as uh, in, in the next few days in, in this coming week. But, you know, beyond that process, the process of having the House Judiciary Committee take up this question would then involve subpoena power, would in, then involve taking witnesses. This is what happened during the Nixon impeachment proceedings. I understand when people say, well, the Republicans control the House Judiciary Committee, they control the House of Representatives, they control the Senate. Where do we think this process could actually go? But, you know, there were plenty of people who argued on the day uh, that we launched this campaign on Inauguration Day that there was just no way people would be standing up uh, to demand this. And now we see millions of Americans demanding it. Now we see 17 communities on record. And now we see seven members of Congress on record. And the facts continue to build that this president is defying the rule of law. We must place country over party here and stand up for the basic principle that no one is above the law. So if you were arguing um, for the impeachment uh, in Congress, if you were laying out the case against Trump over this almost a year that he's been in office, not quite yet, can you lay out the articles of impeachment? Yes. We would start with the violations of the two anti-corruption provisions of the Constitution, the Foreign Emoluments Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause. This president is treating the Oval Office as a profit-making enterprise at the public expense. He's taking illegal payments and benefits from foreign governments in violation of the Foreign Emoluments Clause, and he's taking illegal payments from the state governments around the country, as well as from the federal government, in violation of the Domestic Emoluments Clause. That's point one, or point one and two, if you will, because they're two different clauses. Then you have obstruction of justice. This is a president who first demanded loyalty of his former FBI director, James Comey. When he didn't get that, he went ahead and fired him uh, for not letting go, as he put it, of the Flynn investigation and uh, this Russia thing, as he said. Uh, that was obstruction of justice. That FBI director was involved in investigating the Russian interference in 2016 election, its potential connection to the Trump campaign. It led to the appointment of special counsel Robert Mueller. And now we know, based on new 
new reporting by The New York Times that soon after that, the president sought to stop the congressional investigations in the Senate uh, that were going uh, that continue to go on with respect to that. So obstruction of justice, which was the first article of impeachment against Richard Nixon, would certainly be part of this case. Then we have the potential conspiracy uh, with the Russian government, potential collusion to violate federal campaign finance laws and other federal laws and to interfere with our elections. That evidence continues to be built. But it's also an impeachment question, and the House Judiciary Committee should take that up. Then we have the abuse of the pardon power. Uh, this is uh, a, a power that is not unlimited by a president. And what the president has done with the pardon of former Sheriff Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio is he has essentially undermined the due process rights of the thousands of people who are impacted by Sheriff Joe Arpaio's illegal actions. This is the sheriff who was found in criminal contempt of court for, stop, for refusing to stop his illegal practices of detaining uh, people based on the color of their skin. And this president went ahead and used the pardon power in a wrongful way uh, to pardon him. Then we have the giving aid and comfort to neo-Nazis and white supremacists, not just what the president has said after the Charlottesville tragedy, but also his most recent tweets, tweeting out anti-Muslim, inflammatory anti-Muslim videos. This president is giving that aid and comfort to white supremacists. Then, you know, this president also is engaged in recklessly threatening nuclear war. Now, you know, the fact is that the president is the commander-in-chief. He does not have the power to initiate a war that is established under the War Powers Clause, despite the fact that we've seen violations of it in the past. But this takes it to a whole new scale. This is a president who literally is engaged in recklessly threatening nuclear war against a foreign nation. That reckless and wanton disregard uh, for the established norms and for essentially putting millions of lives at stake, threatening really the world, uh, is an impeachable offense. And then finally, most recently, this president has talked about how he would like to see the Justice Department prosecute Hillary Clinton and other political adversaries. This misuse of the Justice Department or attempted misuse to prosecute political adversaries uh, would be another impeachable offense worthy of investigation. How much support do you have around the country? Well, I, I think what we're seeing from the people both signing our petition at impeachdonaldtrumpnow.org and the petition at Need to Impeach that Tom Steyer's initiated is that there are millions already literally on record, uh, millions of 1.3-plus uh, million on our petition. He has over 3 million, and he's reaching a lot of people uh, through that ad campaign. And those members of Congress, uh, some of them have said that they've been responsive to what they're hearing among their constituents. So I, I think people are ready to stand up, uh, and, and they need to, because this is an urgent matter. This is not something, again, that we can wait on for uh, something we look at in 2019 or 2020. We need to lay the groundwork now for the call for impeachment proceedings against this president. That's constitutional attorney John Boniface, co-founder and director of Free Speech for People. Up next, psychiatrist Dr. Bandy Lee on President Trump's mental health and the growing movement of mental health experts called Duty to Warn. Cerca de aquí lo dejaron abandonado, un objeto sin vida junto en la esquina. That's Chicano Batman performing in Democracy Now! Studios. To see our interview and their performances, you can go to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's Democracy Now! special by looking at President Trump's mental health and a growing movement among mental health professionals called Duty to Warn. Last month, President Trump slurred his speech and mispronounced his words during an address on Israel. Let us rethink old assumptions and open our hearts and minds to possible and possibilities. And finally, I ask the leaders of the region, political and religious, 
Israeli and Palestinian, Jewish and Christian and Muslim, to join us in the noble quest for lasting peace. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Israel. God bless the Palestinians. And God bless the United States. Thank you very much. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders responded to questions about Trump's slurred speech by announcing he'd scheduled a physical health exam. The president's throat was dry, nothing more than that. He does have a physical scheduled for the first part of next year. Uh, the full uh, physical that most presidents go through that'll take place at Walter Reed, and those uh, records will be released by the doctor following that taking place. Meanwhile, New York Times chief White House reporter Maggie Haberman commented on Trump's behavior when she was interviewed on CNN last month. Something is um, unleashed with him lately. I don't know what is causing it. I don't know how to describe it. it oh, you see a different. From... You see a difference in the past what days, weeks? I think the last couple of days' tweets have been um, uh, unhinged, markedly um, accelerated in terms of uh, seeming a little unmoored. This all comes as Pentagon leaders told a Senate panel they would ignore any unlawful order by the president to launch a nuclear strike. The testimony came as part of the first congressional hearings in more than 40 years on the president's authority to start a nuclear war. Well, last month, I sat down with Yale psychiatrist Dr. Bandy Lee to talk with her about President Trump's mental health and the growing movement of mental health experts called Duty to Warn. Dr. Bandy Lee is a forensic psychiatrist on the faculty of Yale School of Medicine, an internationally recognized expert on violence. She edited the book The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. The book became a bestseller when it was published in October. I began by asking her about her concerns about President Trump's mental health. It's actually historically unprecedented that so many mental health professionals have come forth with their concerns um, under any president of any party. So it really is the first time that this many mental health professionals are coming together in a coalition. Uh, we even have a website now, dangerouscase.org, where uh, the public and, not, and lawmakers can discourse with us. Uh, there are thousands of us at this point. So talk about Lay out what your concerns are as a psychiatrist. So our concerns are that uh, someone with this level of mental instability and impairment uh, has this much power in the office of the presidency, basically the power to uh, start a devastating war, to launch nuclear missiles. Uh, without any inhibition, uh, you saw from the hearings that there is very little inhibition in place right now. Within five minutes of the commander-in-chief's orders, uh, nuclear missiles could be launched without question. And, and how does that relate to his mental fitness? And, of course, his decision-making capacity. Uh, having such levels of impulsivity, having a loose grip on reality, and being so uh, fragile in his uh, ability to cope with ordinary stresses, such as uh, basic criticisms or unflattering news, uh, will tend to unravel, especially in times of heightened stress, such as under the special counsel's investigations. Mm. Uh, just last week, Tony Schwartz, author of, well, co author of Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, told MSNBC's Ari Melber that the president's inner circle is worried about his mental state. I know that two different people from the White House, or at least saying they were from the White House and that turned out to be a White House number, have called somebody I know in the last several weeks to say, we are deeply concerned about his mental health. That's Wait a minute. You're, you're saying you have knowledge of people calling from a White House line, raising that question? Why would they do that? How do you know that? I know that because I know the person that they called. And this is a person who I absolutely trust, who has great integrity. So that was Tony Schwartz, who I think ghost wrote the book The Art of the Deal, very close to Trump for a period of time. What are your thoughts about what he said? Well, as you know, he has a chapter in the book. Even though he's not counted among the 
27 experts. Uh, we do have three others who have been included for their special insight, their special experience with uh, Mr. Trump, and, uh, and we included him because he has special insight into, into these matters, and I would agree with his assessment. We speak often, uh, we share our observations, and we're both deeply concerned. The chapter that Tony Schwartz wrote in your book, I wrote the art of the deal with Donald Trump. His self-sabotage is rooted in his past. Explain his point here. Um, well, there's actually a lot that's outlined. It's, it's a reprint of an article that he wrote, I believe, for The New Yorker. Um, he uh, outlines very much his interactions and experiences with the president, and he describes most markedly this uh, emptiness, this what he calls a black hole level of uh, self-esteem or, or self-worth that is missing, uh, whereby he can have all the admiration of the world, all the successes, and he will his thirst will never be quenched because of that intense need. And that is what we're seeing over and over. And his what is most concerning for us is that his way of coping with this critical sense of need at every moment so much to the point where he cannot think of the past or the future or consequences. Uh, his main urgency is to quench the need at the moment, and th the way he does this is by uh, burnishing his power, by um, going to belligerent language or, uh, or affirming conflicts and uh, others' sense of um, the world is a threatening place where you have to be violent. Mm. This is Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina speaking about, well, then-candidate Donald Trump. This was back in 2016. I'm not going to try to get into the mind of Donald Trump, because I don't think there's a whole lot of space there. I think he's a kook. I think he's crazy. I think he's unfit for office. So that was Graham in 2016. But Senator Graham sounded different last month when he spoke to CNN. You know, what concerns me about the American press is this endless, endless a attempt to label the guy as some kind of kook, uh, not fit to be president. So that is Senator Graham now. Um, what about what he's saying? I think the um, laypersons, um, the public or lawmakers, uh, would be prone to underestimating the dangers of this president, because uh, most people are used to seeing uh, individuals who are healthy. Um, it's, it's only professionals who see those who are impaired day in and day out. And so the natural tendency will be to interpret what they're seeing in terms of uh, a normal range, a normal variation of human choices, decision making and behavior. Uh, what we are, what we feel pressed to do is to warn about uh, the situation where someone is not uh, acting within normal range, where one is normalizing what is, in fact, a malignancy um, in, uh, in one's interpretation of reality. On Wednesday, the House voted not to impeach President Trump. The vote failed 364 to 58, with all Republicans voting against the measure. The Democratic leadership also came out against the impeachment vote. The measure was introduced by Congressmember Al Green of Houston, who said on the House floor, Donald John Trump, by causing such harm to the society of the United States, is unfit to be president and warrants impeachment, trial and removal from office. And then in April, Maryland Congressmember Jamie Raskin introduced a bill that would create a commission to determine if the president is mental, mentally or physically unfit for office. This is Congressman Raskin, also a professor of constitutional law, explaining how the bill is based on the 25th Amendment. 
Section 4 of the 25th Amendment says that the Vice President of the United States can act with a majority of the Cabinet to determine that there's a presidential incapacity, or the Vice President can act with a majority of any body to be set up, and Congress never set up the body that's called for in the 25th Amendment. So this is us essentially following through on our constitutional obligation to set up a body in the event of a presidential disability, and that's something that would be determined by the body, but of course only with the Vice President of the United States. So we're talking about a body that is nonpartisan, that's independent, and that acts with the Vice President, who of course is reporting directly to the President. So it would be in the most extreme cases where there's a consensus that's developed, the President is incapable of discharging the duties of office. So that is Congressman Jamie Raskin. You're, you just came from Capitol Hill, where you're talking to yes. Democratic and Republican Congress members. What about this? Uh, Senator um, or, or Representative Raskin was one of the members that I got to meet, but uh, unfortunately he was called to vote, so we didn't get to talk much. Uh, he uh, definitely wishes to follow up. And um, we, among ourselves, have also been advocating for an expert panel. Uh, that would be separate and independent and appointed by the National Academy of Medicine. So, in fact, uh, we could work on figuring out what the solution might be uh, for us to be able to form an independent panel that can give recommendations that he could receive through a commission. Let me ask you about this unusual article um, I just read that's sort of going all over the Internet. Could Trump's hair drug threaten his physical and mental health? And it said, this is from months ago. Uh, this week, President Trump's doctor disclosed the president takes finasteride, a drug marketed as Propecia, to treat male pattern baldness. While it's tempting to make jokes about Trump's hair and even the sexual side effects that accompany the drug, it also has many disturbing side effects that neither the president nor any other man should risk. In the 19 years since Propecia was approved to treat hair loss from male pattern baldness, side effects have been so concerning that the term post-finasteride syndrome, PFS, has been coined, and hundreds of lawsuits have been brought. In addition to its sexual side effects, the drug effects on cognition, mood and mental states have been documented in the scientific literature. A 2013 study in Journal of Sexual Medicine noted, Changes related to the urogenital system in terms of semen quality, decreased ejaculate volume, reduction in penis size, penile curvature, reduced sensation, fewer spontaneous erections, decreased testicular size, testicular pain, and prostatitis, unquote. Many subjects also noted a disconnection between the mental and physical aspects of sexual function and changes in mental abilities, sleeping patterns, and or depressive symptoms. Do you think this is relevant? Uh, most definitely. Uh, mental function is not separate from physical function, and many medications have profound effects on the, the mind's capacity. And so, uh, this is one of the reasons why an evaluation would be so critical, because mental impairment can be just as debilitating as physical impairment, and uh, so we—and the both are connected. So uh, to have all the medical records, as well as to be able to get a list of medications and, uh, and to do a medical exam would be essential to doing a mental health exam. That was Dr. Bandy Lee on the faculty of the Yale School of Medicine, an internationally recognized expert on violence, a forensic psychiatrist. She edited the book The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. The book became a bestseller when it was published in October. And that does it for our show, Democracy Now!, produced by Renee Feltz, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Sharina Nadura, Amel Ahmed, and Nat Needham. Mike DiPilippo and Miguel Nagara and Paul Huckabee, our engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley and Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy New Year.